Welcome back to our Revelation verse by verse class. I'm Dr. Scott Campbell from Shoreline Community Church in Akron, Ohio. And we are finally at the seventh trumpet. Out of that comes the final seven bowl judgments. And these judgments are rapid fire. They're one after another, and uh, they are coming right before the Battle of Armageddon and the second coming of Jesus with the holy angels and the saints, the church, the bride of Christ, coming to reign on earth for a thousand years in the millennial kingdom of Christ. And uh, this is what we've been gearing up for. Um, and it's not going to be a pleasant chapter, as most of these have not, because they're full of judgment on an unbelieving world. And the irony is Christ has gone to great lengths. God has sacrificed his only begotten son, Jesus, to provide a way to eternal life in heaven. But man has rejected the cure for the curse of sin. And uh, God's a holy judge, a righteous judge, and he must, he must judge sin. He will by no means clear the guilty, the scripture says, or he wouldn't be holy. But he's gone to great lengths to provide a holy state for man through his holiness of his son. The righteousness of Christ covers the sins of man. And he did that willingly in obedience to the Father's will. And um, it's by grace through our faith that we place in Jesus Christ's sacrifice to cover our sins that we can even have our prayers heard, um, much less have entrance into a holy eternal state with the Lord and reign with him forevermore. Well, here it is. We have uh, the first seven seals, and out of the seventh seal came the seven trumpet judgments. And these basically brought us up to the midpoint of the seven-year tribulation. And then um, towards the end of the seven years, we're seeing what happens now. Now, the interesting thing is, as we go through these final judgments, that the entire world has turned against Israel. And um, we're seeing that come into play right now. And uh, I'm going to leave this up just for a second. You can get a screenshot or freeze your video. And this is going to be much more detail than I'm getting in here today of the eight uh, events of the cam campaign of the Battle of Armageddon. This is a, uh, a whole series of messages in and of itself right on this screen. But um, what we're going to see here today in chapter 15 and 16 is a very quick overview, uh, basically the headline of the Battle of Armageddon. And then next week, we're going to see a more detailed account of the fall of Babylon politically, the political Babylon and the ecclesiastical Babylon, which is the uh, religious system of the of the final days, uh, the reign of Antichrist coming to an end. That judgment in great detail, but that what we're seeing in that judgment here is in headline um, view, uh, an overview, and the details come to follow. It's just like in Genesis where God, he, he made the uh, heavens and the earth and then the seven days of creation, but then in the following chapters, he takes that headline of creation and breaks it down with the details of Adam and Eve and how they... The animals came about and the naming of the animals and the Garden of Eden and paradise and paradise lost because of sin and disobedience of Adam and Eve and so on and so forth. So that's the same thing here. Um, we're going to get into the overview, the headline. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us your word and most of all your son. Help us to prepare to meet you in the air as the bride of Christ and be caught in a random act of kindness, bringing glory to your name. As we watch and pray for your return, help us to stay faithful and bless our hearts today and burden our hearts today as a result of this lesson to reach out to others with uh, how you've changed our lives and the gospel, the power of God to salvation. Lord, help us to communicate that to those we know and, and, and those that you put in our path. In Jesus' name we ask these things. Amen. All right, John the Revelator.
Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. So we see that uh, things are coming to a head here. Um, John says, as he, as he sees these angels in the heavenly realm, he's in the throne room seeing this vision. He says, I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. So this sea of glass, is there a sea in heaven? Well, not a sea like we know it. This is some sort of a floor uh, the, the, where, where things are, are, are standing on a foundation, this glass mingled with fire. What a strange way of describing this. Uh, it's what John is able to see, like a reflecting um, colors coming off the glory of God. The throne is like a rainbow of colors. The brilliance of God, the majesty of God being reflected. Um, it's a virtual symphony of color. And this mirror-like quality, it's probably uh, symbolizing uh, what Hebrews 4.13 says, which is everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. It's setting the scene, showing God's glory, his majesty, and that fire always is a sign of judgment, how he's getting ready to judge the unbelieving world. Um, it's a purification, uh, the, the symbolism of fire also. So judgment, purification from God's throne upon the earth, upon the unbelieving world. Um, and uh, we see throughout Scripture, fire is used as a means of judgment. Um, and um, here it refers to a baptism of judgment upon the unrepentant man and woman on the earth. And what do they do? Well, uh, it says, those who have the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. So on this throne room scene, the featured subject, the featured objects of God's adoring, amazing grace, his love, his mercy, his salvation are the 144,000 and those martyred during this tribulation who refused to bow to the, the beast, to Satan, to the Antichrist, and receive his mark. So here they are. They've had the victory by faith in Christ, and they're standing before the Lord, and it's a worship service. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And those words are, uh, great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. So the song of Moses, uh, we uh, saw that in Exodus chapter 15. You can read that. Um, it's the final victory here in the tribulation as it ends uh, for the believers, for the Jews in particular, uh, who were martyred during this time. Um, but we see the theme of judgment and deliverance cropping up over and over in the scripture. In the Exodus, the children of Israel are delivered into the promised land, out of slavery of Egypt, into the promised land of freedom. In the tribulation, we see the deliverance of sinners by God from their sin through Jesus Christ, who took upon himself the sin of mankind. Here, in, in the revelation, in the tribulation, as it ends, the promise of the kingdom has finally, finally come. And that's what the Jews have been waiting on. Their Messiah to set up the kingdom and deliver them once and for all from the worldly system to the kingdom of God, freedom in God. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. After these things, John says, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So as the heavenly, heavenly uh, throne room scene continues on in this vision for John and for us, we see the real, actual, holy of holies. It was symbolic in the tabernacle of tem testimony in Moses' day, as God instructed him to make a, uh, a 
picture of what was truly in heaven um, in the, te the temple later on with Solomon. But um, here's the real thing. Um, this is the genuine Ark of the Covenant that's contained there in heaven. Um, this is the Holy of Holies that was represented in the temple on earth, the tabernacle on earth, where God would receive the sacrifices from the high priest and dwell between the two cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant. But this is the real picture here, of the actual article, where God dwells. Okay, You can look in Numbers chapter 10 to see um, the, the symbolic here on earth, but uh, the real deal is showing up here in Revelation 15.5. And out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, holy, holiness, purity, and having their chest girded about with golden bands. Now, these seven plagues are the, is the undiluted wrath of God. Uh, these uh, the bands of gold symbolize God's riches, His royalty, His untarnished glory. Uh, this fabric that these uh, angels are, are wearing, um, symbolizing purity, holiness. These belts or girdles uh, would be running to the, from the shoulder to the waist uh, that each of the seven angels would have over these white linen garments. So this is just a symbol, symbolic of, of uh, holiness, and they're holding God's judgment upon unholiness then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of god who lives forever and ever the golden bowls the bowl judgments the bowls full of the wrath of god um now these would be like shallow saucers not bowls like we think of um that would just can you know be able to be filled and filled and poured out um but these would be um associated with the different uh articles of temple worship that we see throughout the old testament scriptures and we would see uh that they use these little saucers very shallow for the wine and for the blood sacrifice um they're shallow they're flat um and that's how the divine judgments are going to be dispensed by these angels upon the unbelieving world. Uh, they are going to just be very quick, emptied instantly. Not a long pouring, but um, a quick and uh, staccato effect. Uh, one after the other of these final seven judgments. Almost as if happening almost simultaneously, just all at once. Um, this is the final judgment. And this um, is going to cover those who've rejected, refused to drink of the cup of salvation provided through Jesus' sacrifice for mankind. They're going to have to drink something, either salvation or judgment. These have chosen judgment. The temple that John is seeing in heaven was filled with smoke from the glory of God. Remember when God in Moses' day uh, showed up in, on Mount Sinai and how the smoke just uh, of his glory uh, brought fear into the hearts of Israel, but just like covered the mountain. Well, it's the same glory, the glory of God being shown here in his temple in heaven. And it shows uh, the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Okay. Just like the high priest was the only one that was able to enter into uh, offer the sacrifices on behalf of the nation of Israel. Anyone else would have been killed by the glory of God. But um, uh, here, no one can enter as God provides this final judgment of these final seven plagues. Now, we are going to enter into chapter 16. And in chapter 16, we see the Battle of Armageddon is what this is describing. In fact, before we get into 16, uh, let's do a little headline overview of what we're about to see through the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. 
Zechariah is describing the Battle of Armageddon in chapter 14 of his prophecy. And he says, And this shall be the plague which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against, is, against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets, and their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and, and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Wow. Um, and, you know, with that kind of a description, with the eyes dissolving in their sockets and, and people standing on their feet and dissolving, I mean, it sounds to us the only way we can comprehend like uh, what we've been told about a nuclear warfare, how so uh, instant things would just uh, be dissolved. Um, and so whether God uses man and his technology of uh, nuclear warfare to bring this about, or God certainly doesn't need man's technology. He can uh, bring this about himself, but either way, it does sound like a, some sort of a instant nuclear uh, fallout here. Well, that was in Zechariah. Let's see if Zechariah's description will coincide with what John is about to see. So John says, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first bowl that we see brings about boils. Okay. We're going to see these loathsome sores upon unrepentant mankind. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So, wow, this is um, uh, the first bowl, cup, vial, however you want to uh, call these judgments. We're going to call them bowls here. But they're immediately inflicted with these ulcers, these sores, these boils, these wounds, you know, and kind of it's re reminiscent of the sixth plague in the books of uh, Exodus, the Egyptian plagues where Pharaoh's magicians were afflicted with sores back in Exodus nine, nine. Um, but uh, the thing about these plagues, these bowls, as they come upon unrepentant man is, Man doesn't ever repent. He continues to reject God and harden his heart, just like Pharaoh did back in the days of Moses. So they are just sold over to the system of the Antichrist, to the system of Satan, their father. Um, and they are beyond being saved at this point. There's no more second chance. They've been given over to their corruptible ways, their corruptible hearts. That's a tragedy. And they blaspheme the Lord. Um, look at the second bowl. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became blood as of a dead man and every living creature in the sea died. We've seen the sea judged uh, several chapters back in the trumpet judgments. And that left one third of the sea had become blood. Two thirds were still available uh, as unjudged, but now it's totally polluted. The entire sea seas, the salt waters of the earth are totally polluted. Um, again, we see in the book of Exodus, the plagues that came upon Egypt because of Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's refusal to listen to God and the oceans become blood and everything in them dies then, well, it's repeating itself now, but totally around the world, not just in Egypt, globally. Okay, think of it, all the fish life, the plant life, the oceans would literally be dead and the stench alone of the rotting animals uh, would be just unbearable. Uh, the ruination of algae and the plankton alone would be life-threatening, but this is just total death to the oceans of the world and all that dwells in them. God has eliminated the sea life. The third bowl, those, 
rivers turn to blood, uh, the fresh water turn to blood also. Uh, in verse 4, it says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters. Notice that he has a um, title, angel of the waters. I mean, there's angels in charge of just about everything, it seems, in God's creation. This angel of the water says, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. For it is their just due. Uh, King James says worthy. For it's worthy judgment. In other words, uh, this is one of the seven worthies, by the way, in Revelation. And the only one with a negative connotation to it. Meaning they've got what they deserved. Um, justice. God's justice is allowing this to happen on those who shed the blood of the saints and the prophets over the centuries. They are worthy of this judgment. And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and was and was is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. For I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgment. As horrible as this is, they got what they deserve. They're just due. Now this is happening almost simultaneously, but we're just breaking it down in headline form here. Again, next week we get a little more detail of what's going on leading up and through this. The fourth bowl. Men are scorched by the sun. I mean, with all that's going on in these judgments, uh, all the way up to this point, Certainly, the ozone layer is gone. The protective layer of, of the Earth's atmosphere is now gone. It's dissolved also. And um, if it wasn't for the ozone layer that we have now, we'd be scorched. Uh, but now, it's totally gone. There is no protective layer. The, then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. So... Wow. You can't imagine uh, what's going on here. You know, we've seen air pollution. We've seen the uh, atmosphere darkened by pollution. We've seen the lack of sun because of pollution. We've seen uh, blood red moons in part because of uh, the ultraviolet rays of the sun uh, being positioned in, as, at such a point where uh, it brought about that blood redness of the of moon. Uh, but now we see the ultraviolet rays of the sun, the harmful rays, are scorching men with heat and fire. It's only reasonable to assume that the wars that were devastating the earth up to this point in the tribulation period have taken the toll, along with the plagues of God, on the atmosphere. And um, everything's just falling apart at this point. And the men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God. They didn't cry out for mercy or for grace, for deliverance. They blasphemed the name of God. They recognized that this was God's hand coming against them. They were literally at war with God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. I mean, we want to feel sorry for these guys, and we should. But they have no repentance in their heart whatsoever. They are so hardened against God. They're fighting God to the very bitter end. I mean, they're, they're living under the leadership of their father, spiritually speaking, Satan. That's where their heart is. And he has hardened and deceived their heart. They have a spirit of delusion that God's allowed them to be locked into, to believe the lie of the enemy as he's believed his own lie. So the fifth bowl we see is a, a darkness and pain uh, upon mankind. Um, we are in verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, Satan's headquarters. 
and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of, the, of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They didn't repent. They blasphemed him and did not repent of their deeds. So man's heart's getting harder as these bowls are, are being brought about. Um, this judgment of uh, the revived Roman Empire of the day, the, the, uh, most likely in Europe, um, some part of the European Union, uh, they're going to especially get hit hard with the, this judgment. Uh, this is the seat of Satan's empire in the end times. And, you know, this could be a nuclear winter uh, description. Uh, these judgments have the dev devastating effects of the nuclear war like we spoke about. But uh, the, all these side effects uh, kind of co coincide with that kind of warfare. No repenting. The sixth bowl, the Euphrates River, is dried up. So we see in verse 12 that the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now, who are these kings? Well, these kings from the east, they may uh, just simply be the Muslim nations uh, like Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, the um Muslim uh, Soviet Republic, all under the sword of Islam. Um, this is going to be the last great jihad for them. And um, it is all about a religious war. Uh, it's Satan versus God. And we know who wins. But from these kings from the east that are having their uh, path uh, enabled now, by the drying up of the Euphrates. God's just bringing it, to have, bringing it to come to pass. John says, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon. Now we see a picture of the unholy trinity here. Satan the dragon. He saw an unclean spirit like a frog come out of the mouth of the beast, the Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, the head of the end times global religious system of worshiping Satan, the Antichrist. Um, yeah, very frightful. But John describes them as these frogs. Demonic activity, unclean spirits. Um, they are the ones orchestrating the march to Armageddon to meet the Lord and be defeated by the Lord at his second coming. Uh, this is the great day of the Lord God Almighty. We hear the day of the Lord throughout the Old Testament prophets, and then we hear the great day of the Lord. This is the end of the tribulation, the great and terrible day of the Lord. For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. That's their sole purpose, orchestrate the end. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments. In other words, is, be, is prepared, is busy watching, waiting, praying, living in light of the fact that the Lord can come back at any moment. That's the one who's blessed. Lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So keep your garments clean. The Lord's saying, live each day as if I'm coming and keep your purity. Stay righteous and be saved now while you can. Don't go through the tribulation. There's no need for it. And they gathered them together in the place. These demons gathered everyone together in a place called, in the Hebrew called Armageddon. Now it's just the Valley of Megiddo is where this is. <clears throat> And this is where the Lord shows up. Now, the seventh bowl, it is finished. Where have we heard that before? We've heard it several places. We immediately would think of the cross of Christ, uh, where he paid for the sins of the world by giving his life. And he is, his last words, it is finished. Tetelestai in the Greek, which is 
paid in full. He paid our sin debt, a debt that we couldn't pay and a debt that he didn't know. Well, it is finished. Look at this in verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. It is finished. Um, it is permanently final. Um, and uh, let's see. John 19.30 uh, has the, uh, it translated, it's, it has been and will remain done. The, the finality of it all, uh, the completion of it all. Um, God's going to bring it all home here with this seventh bowl with the greatest earthquake ever known to creation. He's literally shaking up the universe. And there were noises and thunderings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts. The great city, uh, Jerusalem, and the cities of the nations fell. Uh, being divided into three parts um, is actually a good thing uh, because Christ is preparing uh, not really a judgment here, but uh, an improvement on the topography of earth to receive his kingdom. Uh, it's going to provide an additional water supply, according to Zechariah 14.8, and the different top topographical uh, changes that come as a result of this earthquake. You can read about in uh, the rest of uh, Zechariah 14. But it's preparing the city of Jerusalem, which will be the central headquarters for the throne of Christ during his millennial reign on earth. Jerusalem is the only city to be spared the judgment, according to scriptures, and it's going to be made more beautiful rather than uh, destroyed uh, because of her repentance. Finally, there's repentance in Israel. Uh, 70 AD, there was no repentance after the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, just as he prophesied uh, in 70 AD, the, uh, uh, the temple was flattened. It was just eliminated, destroyed. All the records of lineage for the tr tribes of Israel, the everything, the sacrifices were stopped, the temple worship done. Uh, until 1948, they would not be in, uh, a nation again. They would be scattered abroad. And um, so it says the cities of the nation fell and great Babylon was remembered before God. The Babylon, remember Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the book of Daniel, that great kingdom of the world. Um, that's the world system that has now went global uh, in the last days that Satan really was relishing in and ruling over. Uh, God's remembering Babylon and her sin. And he's, he wants to remember her, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath, the undiluted cup of his wrath, the same cup Jesus took upon himself on the cross for me and for you, for the judgment of our sins. The unbeliever rejects to take that cup uh, of that Jesus had taken. They reject Jesus um, taking the cup for them. And now they must take the cup themselves. So it's better to allow the Lord to receive the cup because he can overcome it. He can resurrect from it into newness of life for uh, our example that he gives us newness of life through his sacrifice. But um, life, the second death, awaits those who take the cup themselves. They can't persevere. They can't overcome it because they have no righteousness. The cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Wow. This is powerful stuff. Then every island fought, fled away and the mountains were not found. So the mountains not being found. Um, this earthquake radically alters the earth topography 
It's preparing the earth to receive the kingdom of God globally. Later, God will make a new heaven and a new earth, a total new remodel, even more than that, just a new, not a rehash, but a brand new earth, a brand new heaven, a new Jerusalem coming out of heaven, a little satellite that we'll talk about uh, in the eternal state. But even when the Lord comes for a thousand years, the earth is unrecognizable as the king has come and rightfully takes back his earth for his people. And we see in uh, verse 20, nothing looks the same. And uh, verse 21, and great hail fell from heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. A talent would be the uh, heaviest load that the average man would be able to carry which would be roughly 75 pounds. Can you imagine a hailstone? 75 pounds, the destruction to the crops, to the trees, what are left, um, to uh, human beings that landed on you. It would just flatten us, destroy us. And who knows how many hailstones, but you know, it says a great hail from heaven. Each hailstone weighed... The weight of a talent, 75 pounds. Men blasphemed God because of that plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. And so, um, this is uh, just the end of the headline. God is going to detail uh, in next week's chapter and in, in the several chapters to follow um, the fall of the worldly system of the political system of Antichrist and the false prophets ecclesiastical global religion of the day. The lesson for next week in chapter 17 is entitled The Great Prostitute and the Beast. And uh, we're going to see uh, the focus on the bold judgments, how they played out on those two world systems. And um, we're seeing things line up with uh, uh, those world systems in our day. How close we are to the Lord's return and his judgment upon the unrepentant here on earth. Father, we just thank you for giving us this, this word of warning, this uh, final plan of your plan for the ages uh, to bring about your kingdom. Lord, burden our hearts to live a life that's pleasing to you in light of this and to bring the gospel as you've commanded us to, to those that you've put in our circle of friends and family, those that you put across our path, Lord. We know what's coming, and we know that the hearts are getting harder as we speak. Uh, Lord, just uh, help us to remain faithful, tenderize us as the world gets harder, uh, give us uh, uh, compassion, mercy. Give us the long-suffering spirit of Jesus, the mind of Christ over all, Lord, to accomplish your goal, to use us as representatives of the coming kingdom and draw those that you've been drawing to an understanding of repentance and salvation that's available through Jesus alone. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for coming. If you enjoy these lessons verse by verse, um, ask that you would please uh, consider subscribing to our our church page we it helps us to get more people to view our videos and to hear the good news of the gospel and um, if you uh, give us a thumbs up like uh, you can leave a comment um, we appreciate any feedback especially those of you who are making decisions for Christ or rededication decisions as Christians or if you just have a prayer request we'd love to hear from you but thank you, and until next week, may God bless you.